Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday Bible Life today. We're going through the parables that Jesus gave. There are 40 of them that we have identified. Our original intent was to look through the parables and find ones that encouraged us to be looking for the Lord's return in a setting such as the people in the parable, servants being in courage to watch for their master's return or for the landowner or something like that and apply that today in our situation where we're anticipating uh, the Lord's return and make application of the principles of these parables to our lives today. Today we're going to be looking at parable number 26. It's entitled The Rich Fool and uh, we find it in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the parables that we're looking at from now until we get through them uh, all come from only the Gospel of Luke. We've already looked at parables that were found in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Some of them were also found in the Gospel of Luke, but now the ones that we're looking at are only found in Luke's Gospel. So if you'd like to get your Bible and turn to chapter 12, of the Gospel of Luke. We'll be prepared to read there in just a few minutes, and we'll begin reading it, uh, verse number 13. But in setting the stage for this particular parable, uh, remember that last week we talked about the persistent friend in need, and that came from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and the setting was that Jesus' apostles had come to him and asked, them, asked him to teach them how to pray. And he did that in that second place in the gospel accounts that we find the model prayer most of the time uh, referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And then he gave this parable and the principle that we should be persistent in prayer if, with the parable about the, the neighbor who had friends arrive uh, late at night, had no food for them, so he went next door and knocked on the door to try to get some food, and they were already in bed, and he persisted in knocking, and finally the man got up and gave him what he needed, so he would quit knocking and quit interrupting his family's sleep. As Christ then went on in his teaching, a crowd began to gather around him, and uh, he told them that that particular generation uh, looked for a sign, and he referred to them as an evil generation, and he went on to say that the only sign that would be given to that generation was the prophet Jonah. And he went on then to uh, teach and speak to the crowd. And there was a certain Pharisee that invited him to come and have a meal at the Pharisee's house. And so he went. And his disciples went along too. And as, his, as he was there, and they went inside and sat down and began to eat. The Pharisees who were there began to be judgmental towards Jesus because uh, he had not ceremonially washed his hands uh, like they taught that one needed to do before they partook of a meal. And then Jesus began to tell them and to teach the principle that we're going to find in this particular parable about the rich fool. And that was that the problem is on the inside, not on the outside. There's another place where Jesus told the people, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man, because what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And uh, so he, then he goes on and he tells his uh, disciples there that are gathered around that to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And he talked about them making the outside of a vessel clean, but the inside was still dirty and so forth. He's going to eventually get to this issue of covetousness. And covetousness is a sin that can't always be seen from the outside. Uh, sometimes we can see uh, the evidence of it by the way a person acts. But it's possible to be covetous on the inside and to hide it from the outside where people uh, can't see it. And these Pharisees were good at that in that uh, they did all kinds of ceremonies on the outside and washed their hands and and kept all the rules and the, he went on even to talk about them here uh, giving tithes of all the herbs and seeds that they had and so forth. 
but they miss the weightier things of the law, like compassion and being obedient to the Lord and so forth. And certainly in this particular case, recognizing him and, and acknowledging him and trusting and believing him as the Son of God and the Messiah. So there's a crowd began to gather around the Pharisee's house. And there were lawyers there. And the lawyers also mentioned that uh, when he spoke about the woes that he spoke concerning the Pharisees, that it offended them as well. And Jesus then turned his attention towards the lawyers. And the lawyers in those days, as we have commented before, were the experts in reading the, the scriptures. They weren't necessarily lawyers like what you and I think about in courts and so forth today, but they were the ones that understood the scriptures and they would be right along there with the scribes and the Pharisees, the lawyers that knew the word of God. And Jesus gave a woe towards them as well. And he talked about the hypocrisy that we said was the leaven of the Pharisees. And Jesus told his disciples that whatever is spoken on the inside in the uh, closed quarters will be shouted in the streets and whatever is hidden will be revealed and so forth. And he's working his way towards revealing in this parable the fact that the issue is covetous on the inside and not necessarily any type of ceremonial law keeping or procedures that we do on the outside. And so Jesus said, don't be afraid of those people who kill the body, but after that can do nothing. But instead, be afraid of him who, after he kills the body, has the power and authority to cast one into hell. Uh, that's who you should be afraid of. And so think about several years after this, uh, the Apostle Paul will come along. He will have been raised a Pharisee. He will be one that uh, persecuted the church and the new believers, the Christ followers, uh, after Christ's ascension. And he will be one that's an example that Jesus is giving here. Don't be afraid of him who can kill the body, but after that can't do anything to you. But rather be afraid and fear God, because God not only can bring about the death of the human body, but then he also has the power and the authority as judge to cast one into hell. So as we go further down this uh, chapter 11 and into chapter 12, and this crowd is gathered around the Pharisee's house. Someone spoke out from the crowd. And that brings us to where we find this parable that begins in the 13th verse of chapter 12 of Luke. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the thing he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We'll bring all of this to a close and tie the loose ends together in a little bit with the idea that we should be laying up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. But in this particular parable, he's bringing about the fact that this rich man had a dilemma. His crops yielded such a great harvest that he ran out of room to store everything. It's like we almost having too much money to put in our billfold or too much money to put in the bank and looking for another place to hide it or to store it or to whatever, keep it. And this parable came about. Well, as we think about this parable, remember back about what 
the rich man said the number of times that he used the word I or my. He didn't have any regard or thought for life beyond the here and now. Jesus refused to become the judge or the arbitrator between this man and his brother concerning inheritance. Uh, Jesus' first coming was not to be a judge. Jesus' first coming was to be the suffering servant, the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. His second coming will be quite a bit different. In that coming, the Bible tells us that he will indeed come as judge of the quick and the dead, of the living and the dead, and he will be that one that not only can kill the body, but then has the power and the authority to cast one into hell or take on into heaven. So Jesus addressed the issue of covetousness. Probably most all of the world could rightfully uh, convict those of us in America of having a life that's tainted by covetousness. And then Jesus presented this parable. And then the verses that follow from verse 22 through 34, it's as if Jesus gives his commentary on this parable. And I'd like to read those now, beginning in verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God yet feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide for yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there is the parable and Jesus' commentary on the parable. When we consider this parable, think about this uh, rich fool that Jesus referred to in this parable. If we think about him, and just the things that are said about him, he may appear to be a law-abiding citizen. He may have been a good neighbor. He was living the good life, living the dream, as we hear people say here in America. He was not said to be wicked. He was not uh, crooked in politics. Uh, he apparently was not running any type of shady business. Uh, he didn't uh, have any accusations of being an alcoholic or an immoral person. Uh, in fact, we would look at him and say that God has blessed him. He has great abundance. Everything he touches seems to turn to gold. He has the Midas touch, as people might say. So in our eyes, he might have seemed okay. We might judge that uh, he was just fine. But Jesus called him a fool. He gave all of his thoughts to himself. There were a whole lot of times that we read I, my, and mine in that parable. You don't always see covetousness on the outside, as we mentioned earlier. If we live just for ourselves and for this particular time and nothing beyond this life, Jesus says that we're a fool. Jesus then said, things like he did in the Sermon on the Mount that were familiar to us. Look at the birds, he said, and learn from them. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't have storehouses, and yet God provides for their food. How much more important are we than birds, he says. Then he said, consider the flowers or the grass of the field, how they grow. 
They don't toil or spin, yet they are clothed in more beauty than even Solomon had. The whole matter came down to what we read in verses 29 through 31, and that was, seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew's account from the Sermon on the Mount is probably worded a little bit more familiar to us. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This parable of the rich fool, uh, unfortunately, uh, could be directed at many of us in our country. All of a sudden, it seems so, the apple carts turned upside down in our country in the last few weeks and months. But we've been going along and enjoying God's blessings upon our country and uh, blessings on many of us individually. And we realize that those things are not the absolute most important thing for life. And we've even learned that in the last few weeks about uh, various pleasures that we uh, attend to and spend money on, uh, sports activities and uh, going places and doing all kinds of things. And all of a sudden when uh, destruction comes and homes and businesses are destroyed, uh, all those pleasurable things don't seem to be of the utmost importance anymore. We understand that life that God gives us is precious. And this particular parable is directed at uh, encouraging us not to have covetousness well up on the inside of us and to make people think that we're okay because of the ceremony or the things that we do on the outside. But God would have us to lay up treasure in heaven uh, where moth and rust does not destroy and we can't take our money with us, as many people have said, but we can send it on ahead. When we give and support various ministries and uh, the things that uh, worship God, it's as if we put money in a savings account in heaven for us later. So we can't take it with us, but we can send it ahead. And so this particular parable of the rich fool would encourage us not to be covetousness, but to, first of all, think on things above, not on things below. And where our money is, there will our heart be also. So invest in the Lord's kingdom while we have opportunity. Next week, we'll be looking at another parable from the Gospel of Luke, and it will be from also uh, chapter 12, and it will be about the watchful servants. And that will be a parable in particular that motivated us to begin this study on the parables in the beginning a parable that tells us to be looking for the Lord's return just as the watchful servants were looking for their master's return. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of it and the wisdom of it. Help us that we might apply it to our lives, that we might apply this parable of the rich fool to our lives and not be accused of being like the rich fool that only lives for the here and now and doesn't think about eternal things, but help us to take this in mind, to invest in your kingdom, and to store our riches in heaven, where moth and rust does not come in and destroy. Because you have told us, wherever our money is, there our heart will be also. Thank you for these who join us online. I pray that you would bless them and their families and their homes, keep them safe and in good health. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation you've given and provided. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Until next time, Lord bless you.